All right. Welcome, everyone, to the KCP community meeting on this lovely Thursday. Um, as someone said earlier before we started the recording, we have a full house. Um, so it's great to see you all here. Um, it's, it's really lovely to see so many new faces. Um, before we get started, be aware that this is a meeting under CNCF governance. That means, in specific, please follow the CNCF code of conduct, um, which boils down to let's be excellent to each other. So relatively easy to follow, to be honest. Um, with that, before we get into the reason why I think everyone is here, namely MJ's introduction to KCP, um, if any of the new joiners want to introduce themselves, uh, you're very welcome. We would love to hear about you. Can I introduce yes. myself? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Um, hello, I, I, I'm Yitz. Um, I'm currently working at Aerock, a hyperscaler company that is based in Europe. I, and I've been involved in a Kubernetes project as a release team member for the last four releases and also have been experimenting or interested in the KCP project as a whole. So I have been lurking in the Slack channel and asking questions. All right, great. Happy to have you here. Um, all right, someone else. Hello, I'm Erwan. Uh, it's going to be short. I'm a co-worker of Yeet, actually. So same background, same interest. Great to have you here. Anyone yeah, else? Just, just from my side, my name is Mirza Kulpic. Um, I work with um, SAP and uh, work on a couple of uh, different uh, Kubernetes projects, but I'm really excited about KCP and what we can do with control plans. And I would love to learn something here today. So thanks for having me. All right, thanks for joining, Mirza. Is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? Yeah, I can go next. My name is Jan Vilius. I work for Accenture. And uh, well, I guess same as Mirza, we have a couple of use cases for KCP, and I'm uh, hoping to contribute more in the future. Glad to have you here, Jan. All right. We've had plenty of uh, introductions. Anyone else? All right, then again, welcome to everyone. And I think I will hand it over to MJ. Yeah, so thanks for this. Honestly, I didn't expect that so many people joined, so it's uh, no pressure. I want to keep this very informal. If we see value in that, we can do a separate recording, publish it in YouTube. As Marvin mentioned last time, maybe a blog post. So let's gather ideas and if, I miss something. If I make something wrong, Marvin, old timers, feel free to jump in and correct me. And if you have any questions, just unmute and talk because once I start sharing screen, I will not see the what you're having. So I will try to go a bit as as I would want that somebody presented this this when I started the project. So basically, let's see how it goes. So, but before, okay, so I forgot I'm kind of introduction for myself. So I'm an MJ, I've been with a project, I think from very early days, basically when it's shaped, changed forms, changed ownerships, and I changed companies too. But the concepts of uh, control planes were so appealing to me that I kind of sticked around. I built managed Kubernetes offerings at scale, at enormous scale before and control planes were always the issue in any of those architectures there was something missing in ecosystem which forced our hands to make not ideal solutions so once i found it out about kcp i kind of sticked around so let's go into that so crash course what this what does it mean to using kcp in 2024 so agenda for a bit, we'll cover a bit of repositories, development, like how does one write code for it? How does one interact with it? Uh, how does one use it? Like Helm, YAML, things everywhere. So I said, I'm gonna try to keep it very much informal. So 
If you look around, KCP has a lot of buzzwords in there. So we have a, quite a few articles out there, but at the same time, product evolved. So if you see these, they're KCP related, but all of these are gone. So anything what's in there, basically, which out, they are, some of these things are still in a project, some of them are in a archive repository. Some of them are in a contrib repositories, basically looking for a better days, maybe more, more users. So like ideas we still potentially as a community would like to do, but we reduce the scope. So just to clear it out, these are the main things currently in an ecosystem. And I will talk about these things a bit. And I, Assume that you know some of these KCP specifics. So I might be mentally jumping ahead, but if you miss something, just stop me, basically. So these are the things. So let's jump into this. So main repository, I think as you, most of you know, is KCP, KCP dev slash KCP, but Repository is just repository. It's like you can read the documentations, you can find things around. I think I'm more interested in, okay, how does one try it? How does one play with this thing and, and basically see what's there? So we kind of leading into development and a bit of demo. So let me know if you need this to be a bit bigger. So if you check this out repository on the most Linux machine, so I'm at the main branch with a bit of diff. Like if you have a Golang prerequisite installed, mostly it's a Golang, the first thing you do is CMD KCP start. So this guy will, oh, okay. Here we go, I'm wrong here. So this will start a single, it's a single binary KCP instance. That doesn't mean that it's a way to run. It's more for the development proof of concept, IoT, like you can do that. So like uh, analogy would be like K3S in a Kubernetes land at a single node. So like when I'm talking about KCP, KCP consists of these things. So if you have a front proxy, which is a, a KCP aware uh, load sort of like a load balancer type of utility. Like if Nginx is for uh, requests, front proxy is for uh, KCP related things. You have a KCP control plane, you have a KCP cache and data storage. And uh, in this case, it's a representation of two KCP shards. So potentially shard one, and shard two, and these things they would be deployed, let's say, in a HA model in the production environment, something like that. But this means they are they are geo splitted, geo isolated, and this very much is a it's one of the I would say pseudo reference architectures, but that doesn't mean you need to deploy it in this way. It's just a how things can do that. So, okay, let's get back to raw nodes. So once you start this instance, that single binary runs everything inside of it. It runs a, a mini front proxy, runs a control plane, runs in memory TCD. So if you look for the KCP folder, you will find uh, some certificates generated for it. You will find the ATCD data, service account key. So basically, it's a bootstrap way to, to get it running. So if we config, uh, get the kubeconfig setting. So we get now into, into KCP instance itself. So as you might know, in a KCP, what it does, it's a, it can host multiple control planes. And uh, in a KCP, it's represented as a workspaces. 
So if you if you install the Accrue our BS uh, BS or KCP uh, add-on, you basically get a kubectl workspaces or VS workspace. So basically, there is a CLI command where you interact with a, there we go, with a workspaces itself. And again, everything is in a same monorepo. So if you change something, basically you get change something. So now let's, let's uh, let's explore the concepts before we go into the code base so if i do get workspaces uh, yes use root so there is this uh, root is special like a root of workspace is uh, just a name what we call, but that doesn't mean, I will show later on a bit how we can deal without root. But every time you see root in a path, think of uh, uh, system management administrator thingies, not uh, something what the customers could see. But again, that's a perception. So let's say we create a workspace called Tom. So now I got, in create i got created a workspace so hence a mini control plane inside of kcp instance so use tom i can jump into that i don't have any workspace inside of it so that's like how you move around so let's get a bit deeper so get so there is this concept of uh, if you've seen multiple talks from marvin me stefan we talk about this API export and API bindings. It's uh, one of the methods how we share it. You can share APIs within, uh, within KCP. So if I do KCP bindings, I don't see anything. If I can see API bindings, I can see that I have topology and kcp.io. So like this workspace Tom has bounded APIs to it. So if we check them, and this is done automatically and you can look through that like when you create a workspace workspace under the hood has a this abilities to say how the workspace would look like think of template helm template when you instantiate a new control plane you can say i want these apis to be available in a form of uh, bindings and it can do that so if we open one of those in this server we can see that uh, what binding says it says mostly where it's coming from so what exports exports this binding and status has some resource schemas so we see like tenancy api group workspaces resources some credentials to make it secure again we'll not get into much detail there but what does it gives to this workspace if I do API resources, I will see that you, we saw the workspaces objects. They are becoming automatically as, a, as API resources, as a API entities you can consume in this control plane. But if you look for CRDs, which we all know and like, there is none. So we they look and feel like a native cube type. It's a bit different backing uh, way. So that's like how API works. Uh, if we go now into, remember in this uh, API tenancy, we saw that this API export is provided by tenancy root export. So cool, let's let's go and check it out. Yes, double dot, which gets me to that my current root. And I put the dot on this, I will tell what's current root is later on. If I now check API API bindings in a root workspace, I see some. And if I see API exports, I see some. So the one I'm interested in is uh, KCPIO. So 
that's the one which exported the workspaces. So if you remember before, in the, there, there was a workspaces and workspace types. So these guys are defined here in the API export. There is a secret created and it says, these are the types I'm exposing. And there is another refer object referring, refers a different object. This is API resource schema. So, okay, let's check it out. API resource schema. I have a bunch of them. So if we get into any of them, come on. I always enjoy when people look me mistyping things. Okay, let's take lazy way out from this. Cool. So if we take a KC, like any of the API resource schema, it looks very much like a custom resource definitions spec. So not to invent a bicycle, basically, it is kind of different level of custom resource definition. This is the one which can be mapped to one to many. So basically, if we have this, so we can share API bindings, API bindings uses resource schema, and that doesn't need to be different workspaces. You can deal with that in the same workspace. So that's that's basically it. So uh, what else I had in my notes? Cool. So now this is like a how you do this thing. So if you go now example to back to root, we see a bit more of the workspaces. One of them is unavailable. This code is not yet merged, but this is coming. For example, okay, this doesn't work because I use different branch. So every workspace has a logical cluster behind it. Get the logical cluster. So if you go into any workspace, you will be able to see get logical cluster, a singleton item cluster. If I go to Bob, I get a logical cluster. And as per our docs, I have this uh, here we go. Each workspace is backed by a logical cluster but not all logical clusters may be exposed as a workspaces. So it's kind of one-to-one -one mapping, but not quite. It's a basically our way to separate things at the ATCD layer. So the workspace is more like a user interface to logical cluster. And if you start looking to these things, if you start reading the code, you will start noticing uh, that they wire together in a way that basically even that it's even the status on the logical clusters is like more space initiated so that's that so cool uh yep any questions is it okay if we ask questions while you're presenting or should we yeah uh, just go for it okay does each logical cluster have its unique url uh yes I think yes. Like um, I'm pretty sure yes. If we clash, we kind of have a challenges. And uh, and then does the URL of the logical cluster match the one of the workspace if they're like bundled together, or is that completely separate from each other? Mm, so they are matching in a way that. Uh, I'll give it a Marvin, you had a recent presentation with that, and you had a very nice explanation of that. I actually don't know which which explanation you mean, but basically, I think the way it works is that, as you can see, the the workspace URL is different from the logical cluster one, mm -hmm. but KCP basically understands both formats, so it has a resolver kind of a workspace name to logical cluster that is going on behind the scenes. Right, this one. So what this is, it's a base 36 string 
if I don't think it's string of this. So there is this mapping there for sure. So I think, uh, so yeah, basically they map. Like I said, like each and every, like in this case, say like this logical cluster, this logical cluster now holds this one workspace, but I can create Bob two. So basically, if I go now out YAML those two, RND five, this one, you see this basically, they're different, they have these two workspaces now are backed by the different logical clusters in there, but these ones should match. Yeah, so these ones are hosting logical cluster of uh, of this workspace. So you nest them together. So if now I go into Bob2, it's like 2BV, get logical cluster. Yeah, it's 2BV, basically. That workspace is backed by this logical cluster. Does this make it a bit cleaner? It, it makes it uh, perfectly logical, <laughs> <laughs> so, so to speak. Of. No, it makes, yeah. makes sense to me. I was just exactly. curious because they did they did have different URLs, um, but now it makes sense to me. It's, a, it's a tree. It's a tree of like, and this is very good transition to jump into a bit of the code. So if you go to the code base, like uh, it's very much a self, uh, self-explanatory in a code base. Like APIs are a bit different with they sit on SDK package like CRDs itself together with client and CMD because we felt that shipping this as a separate uh, Go module makes developers life easier when it's in the SDK subfolder. So we kind of have a great move of code, we moved it around. But this is what I wanted to show, like the in proxy itself, the index is, uh, where are now UI proxy index? Come on, let me just. Start cluster. There we go. So this is basically the the code in the package index index state index basically, which serves. Uh, uh, as a backing store for the front proxy. But where it is held, like it stores a multiple states of the current system. And this is very nicely there with like, we have a shard name, logical cluster workspace and the logical cluster as a value. Like shard logical cluster, parent logical cluster, because we need to resolve to parent. Shard logical workspace name because we need to resolve directly to the workspace. So this kind of shows the hierarchy a bit. So we have these uh, in memory stores. So each and every time you create a new workspace or create a logical cluster or update something, there is an index controller which manages the state and deals with the, like, it's a bit, uh, unpolished code place, but let's say if you upset in workspace, it makes sure it adds these things into the state. And when the request gets from proxy, like here, it knows where to go. It's like, oh, uh, this, uh, there is this random string coming, which, where sh I should send it. So in a code, it goes, does a lookup and there is like, okay, by like 
start name to base URL by having a like logical cluster, it can resolve immediately to shard, sending it to the shard, shard will deal with the resolution. So basically it contains any permutation of routing decision you need to make in a system. Like we can think, we can improve this code base, but basically that's how, how it's currently done. And if you're running this in a go binary mode, you have this, uh, It's a mini proxy. Like you have a big proxy and you have a mini proxy, which works in a local proxy. Here is the one, I think that's the one. Yeah, so that's a mini front proxy. I saw it, I knew, seen many mini somewhere. But basically this guy is used in a TCP start. But when you use this in a shard model in a bigger environment, this is not being used. So it it's basically has, in the end, when it resolves the URL, it uses the same index state, just the index state is being populated by two different things. And this is why like, it's almost close to what you're running in the production, but not fully. So you need to be aware of these things. So that's, okay, so that's a, Code base. And as I said, it's a very much a Kubernetes style reconcilers, like informers are being set, reconcilers are split by API groups or certain features. But basically, it's a very much, very much there. Example we have a replication cluster controller, which uh, I think this guy helps see the, oh, this one caches. Like we had a cache as mentioned in the before this guy. So this guy helps to, when you're dealing with multiple control planes and one control plane needs to know about other control planes objects, but not in a full blown ETCD state, but just certain things. So there is a separate controllers running in each and every shard, which goes and talks to, to basically to the cache proxy and seeds the data. So again, if you updated some of the API exports, it will replicate it under in a shared place in a way. So this way you can use APIs from one shard to another because they basically share the state in a shards. So, and this is like where you might where you might find this and you look start reading a controller's code in some of the cases let me see if i can find now we have this informers which uh, so let's see the logical clusters ones we have a double informers basically which goes list local state and the cache state uh, Logical cluster informer, no. I said I am very much went in. No, I can't find it out of the box now. But idea is you read the code and you will see something like a remote in the uh, informer or uh, like a local one. Because what it does, it basically it uh, it gets the data from two informers, one from the cache, one from the local uh, shard, and can act on on these things basically, on act on a state of the remote case. Like if you need to update APIs or update things which coming from the other side. Uh, do, 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 do. Come on, one second. I should just uh, kill this Discord, but I don't think I did. Really? Okay, so so that's that. Okay, so uh, cool. Any? I'm gonna jump now again bit to CLI to show how this looks like in a sharded deployment, and uh, look a bit to Helm. 
So any questions about code base before I jump out? Nope. Sounds like we're ready to move on. Okay. So we talk about shards a lot in KCP. We say it's a global deploy, like it can do a global scale and everything. But when you run KCP start, it's kind of hard to get this grasp. Like, so what is shard? Like how to do that? So if, for example, I'll get back to here a bit, use root, I see one shard. So I didn't show this before. Like in a KCP start, you see one shard. So basically everything is within one. And uh, like one of the mistakes I did early when I started writing KCP aware controllers is I didn't took into account multiple shards. So when you do that, you need to think how, how things work basically. And that goes a bit to the, and I will show like, a, let's see, if we go back a bit, let's see, API export and take um, tenancy.kcp.io. Like API exports are backed by this virtual workspace. And I will no, not go into very much details about this, but basically it's like, a, it's, it is what it says. It's a virtual workspace with shared API. But you see, it's a, it's a basically, it's a single entity now. But if I go now to if my- I, If I can jump in, maybe we yeah, should yeah. explain the concept a tiny little bit. So virtual workspace are essentially um, kind of proxies that speak the Kubernetes API language, same as any other workspace, but they don't have their own data storage. So they are basically providing a computed view on the data that is in your KCP. I um, think that hopefully explains it a little bit. Right, nicely said, thanks. Okay, so if I go now here, uh, I think this one is my, get shards, in this environment, I have two shards available. So basically there is a two, two, two KCP deployments deployed backed by the single uh, proxy in front of it and a shared KCP cache. And now if I go API bind, API exports in this kind of environment, Now I see that basically I have two virtual workspaces pointed by, uh, back by the internal URLs, which uh, de how, depending how you deployment, you need to deal with the networking behind them. But your controllers need to be, controllers watching example, data from API exports. S simply put, when you have a single API server, and you write a Kubernetes controller, you point it to that API server and it does the job, does the magic. In this case, you need to instantiate two controllers watching both one of these basically. And if you have five of them, you instantiate five instances of them. Again, you can optimize this stuff, but this is like simply bluntly put. put. It's uh, again, it's a computer, so you can wire things differently and they, we work. So, so now basically then in this environment, if I create workspace, mm -hmm. uh, Um, but uh, it's a customized environment. So I have a workspace test. So in this case, it got allocated me to one of the shards. Like to which shard? 
users should not care. Like you could target specific shards if you want to, but in reality, it's like if I created six of them, they are currently the targeting is a bit uh, straightforward. It's almost round robin, so it will go one to one. So if I create six, they should be three and three at best. So now if I go to this, let's say, how does this look like in a Kubernetes land? Like, how do we do this thing? So if I get a BS and I'm going to show something here, which I'm uh, trying now to put it into the core. So PRs are there. So if I use, uh, so mounts, there was a buzzword mount. Mount is like, I think one of our attempts to bring back compute to KCP. Before it was transparent multi-cluster, these concepts, I think, were a bit of uh, too complicated, and uh, different people had different opinions on those. So we thought, okay, how we can do this differently? And one of the idea was, uh, let's borrow a concept from a Linux file system mount, where you take FuseFS and you mount remount, remount storage, and it just looks like a file or directory in your file structure. So in this case, this is something similar. So if we take read AKS, AKS basically has this magical annotation where it says like uh, experimental mount, some URL where this mount, how this mount is located. And there is a type which has what, the, what object this backing, this mount point. In this case, is kind cluster. And this is everything is very much uh, up for implementation. So basically, if you can write your own fuse driver, basically you can write your own mounting protocol. In this case, this object is an arbitrary object. The only thing which tells that it's a mount point is uh, is this, like, is mount point true? This means now KCP core will treat this object as a mount point and annotation present on the workspace will wire them together. For now, it's annotations. Once we settle down on APIs, it should move some way in a spec potentially. But so that's like a, a bit of a hint how it is. So if I now used this go getting to my original get VS. AKS, API resources. I can't type anymore. So if I see now, this is full blown Kubernetes cluster. Like I have config maps, I have some cert manager deployed, I have nodes. Because now I'm not in speaking to the workspace directly. I'm speaking to the normal Kubernetes remote cluster living somewhere in uh, AKS. So why I jumped into here, I wanted to show how the KCP cluster deployment looks like. So what we care about is uh, uh, these things, like KCP prefixed at things. So, it's a one shard backed by kind, another shard backed by kind, not a CD, and a shared cache used by both, front proxy used by both, this one basically, front proxy used by both, and a Postgres serving as a database for them. Like ideally, they could be backed by its own ETCD stores, but uh, this is for the cost purposes, keeping it small, it uses the same Postgres instance in a cloud. And they have a single exposed URL, which is KCP URL basically pointing to the front proxy. So if I go back again, just to connect dots, these three workspaces, they all point to the central proxy URL, 
we have a random URLs, and we basically front proxy knows where to do the request. So now the the final thing from this environment I want you to show is I do this here and I do this here. I'm says so like current workspace is root, current workspace is blah something. Because this is it's a it's a forest, it's not a tree. So what I, when I said started the presentation, I said root is special. And then you see root, think of a system space, basically. In this case, if I go BS3, show workspace tree, I see full tree, which is like uh, some implementations of mine using this tree. If I don't do the same here, I see a different tree. And that's something what user could see. Like different users logged in, they would see their own tree, many users, basically many trees, hence the forest. So the root is special there, but it's not mandatory. And we can grant users something like that. And this is a, it's a not very straightforwardly exposed in a code, but you can wire things together and provision your own workspaces, logical clusters, basically to enable this kind of flow. Cool. So, help me stuff. Any questions here? I do have a question around like the mounting philosophy. Like, how do you, what kind of concrete use case would you see for the mounting thing? And how does that fit in the broader like KCP project goals? Like, the projects say that the yeah, idea is kind of to emulate like SaaS like. Yeah. The software as a service with cube apis so would the idea be that i don't know for example you have a customer or internal team that brings their own cluster they mount it into kcp and they can bind to some other apis like i don't know a managed mongodb that you spawn for them or is that not at all the kind of vision that you it's, have i think basically all of the above like imagine situations like a, it's still kubernetes looks like api and in majority cases People will build products which will deal with Kubernetes-based environments. Not, not required, but uh, it is. Like, uh, take example, Crossplane. Crossplane just takes a bunch of CRDs and derives a state from them and applies to the, the pure cloud accounts. Like, what you could do now is, instead of dealing with a... Uh, Let's say you have your cross-plane deployed here. Create cross-plane, uh, double S or single S? I'm phasing out. <laughs> double S. Type far rows. So I could install a uh, cross-plane now into this workspace, but at the same time, like, how do I go with binding this, uh, like saying, okay, cross-plane, talk now to my AKS cluster. Sure, your AKS cluster is located at kts.azure.com, something, something, something. It's just this additional wiring which people would need to do instead of you could say, okay, cross-plane, Talk to second yes use clusters. Talk to this, which is inside of a uh, same KCP instance. So now you're basically doing a uh, hop down and up, basically. So you can bring them closer. That, that one use case. Another use case would be like. KCP itself, it doesn't run a workload, but when you need to run a KCP aware controllers, you will still need to run them somewhere. So you can run them at a remote cluster and the point to the KCP, but at the same time, you can mount that cluster and uh, basically have it close to here. It's just, it's the same way how you mount a FuseFS. Like, why do you mount it to your Linux file system? 
because you need to have it close on that machine. You need to access it there, not to go over the network or different server, SSH to different server to access your file. So it's basically like, in my head, it's the same, same mentality. Have it in close, have it in the, in the same hierarchical tree. And you can come up with any other funky use case you can come up, to be honest. Stefan, do you want to add something to that or? Yeah, just not only think about uh, individual clusters, think about there's a V cluster idea. You could build a V cluster as a service where everything is in this tree. So you, everybody gets basically all the V clusters a person has access to. Same thing like, I know, SAP Gardener or something like that, Chromatic. You could use that as another front end where you are super fast in navigating back and forth and writing controllers against those in parallel. All right. And authorization, authentication is another thing. So one could have a unified authentication stack. Basically, the user identities come from KCP and they map somehow to the clusters. So there are many product ideas one could come up with, I guess. I think all things considered, it pays into the idea of KCP being a global control plane. No matter if you like order your MongoDB instances from it in your workspace, or if you manage your Kubernetes workloads, it all goes through the same single pane of glass. And this is this shows mounting a cluster, but that doesn't need to be a cluster. So if I go, I think this is maybe a bit of a, a misconception. Like if I get VS ATS that YAML, like. A, Ideally, like this, this mount point is backed by this URL. This URL might be your MongoDB connection string. Like if you craft a credentials authentication right, like use the same KCP authentication, like you can just fire this in your database client. So you can, from KCP control plane, by the same way how you access a workspace, you can access database. So create database and mount something here. <laughs> okay. But like you get ideas, like the cluster, Cluster is just a, our way to, to, to show it because we know clusters very well. So, but again, you can mount whatever you want. You can mount an, a third party API there, something like that. So, Helm, Helm, Helm. So, yep. Uh, yeah, I, I got a question about the um, uh, the mount proposal of yours. Can you explain maybe a little bit on the difference between the the mounts proposal as a as a proxy as i understand it uh, versus um implementing controllers for pods and the like directly uh, because stefan just mentioned the v cluster stuff which i guess uh defers to to the controller logic for containers which was removed from kcp a while ago i think it's a bit different like idea is uh the thinker stuff itself, like a V cluster is what we used to have a thinker, which uh, when I need to explain to people, I say, spec down status up. So, like you create an object which uh, in a control plane, which don't act, nobody acts on it in that particular uh, environment. In example, on KCP, you create a pod. There is no controller to act on pod schedule it, but there is a controller which uh, takes that pod spec, sends it down to the underlying cluster, waits until the underlying cluster does the job, schedules the pod, and syncs up the, basically, the status. So it looks and feels like this pod is running in your KCP environment or a control plane, where it, you know, in reality, it's not. So it's a different stuff. Like, you, you're moving states around instead of directly accessing the cluster. Like, you can do both. Like, this is the syncing up and down like proxying has a 
different advantages and disadvantages too. Like you expose potential everything, you might want to enable some filtering. So our good friend uh, working from certain fruit company is building a proposal in upstream to enable filter ex example by uh, by namespaces in a in a watches and uh, like you would be able to mount just the five namespaces from the cluster so i think they don't like compete to each other they are very complementary just a proxy is something uh, straightforward pass through thing which you can again it depends on implementation where i think are just uh, said stay spec down status up so it's okay. uh, and uh, the um, and the mount proposal that would be here in this picture you you show that would be a, a different cluster back by the front proxy or would it be right so it would be something like this it will be let's say guess cluster and it just goes from here knowing there and skipping the control plane altogether right but that's again depends on the implementation like in the environment where i showed that there is this uh different component here running which handles the connectivity to the cluster handles some of the things like a proxy implements virtual workspace basically so like it's at the front proxy level if we go to the code like it's always show me the So there is this uh, the resolve stuff mappings. Basically, what it does is just reverse proxy to the URL wired by the machinery itself. Like it injects the resolve the URL. If it's a mount point, basically just forwards the request. At the other end, implement a KCP specific machinery like a virtual workspaces. You can access the authentication and authorization basically of the same way. So it's just simple reverse proxy in the end. But what you can do that is like quite powerful. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we have a five minutes left uh, it's always one of those like let's do 20 minutes presentation like two hours later uh cool so helm is helm i don't need to explain i think what's there in a helm we have a few charts available one is a kcp helm chart so that's a root one what it will do for you it will you deploy a as we say, single instance deployment from proxy, etcd, kcp instance. So that is, uh, it works quite well if you don't deal with our shards. When it comes to sharding, we have a cache, certificates, proxy, and shard subcharts. So these things, they map to these things, if you notice. Cache, from proxy, shard. So if we go here, you deploy and certificates. This is a bit of hacky way until we can get the operator running. But idea is that to run in a sharded environment, you need to have a shared certificates uh, for basically between the shards. So for those who can read Mermaid, this is the diagram of our certificate relationship tree. I don't think I have a. No, it's, I'm in a web browser, so uh, that should be.
there we go. So like if you go into the main repo, you can find that stuff. So basically the certificates needs to be shared between the shards. So one would might ask like, how does one deploys that? So if a uh, shameless plug, if you go back to the main monorepo, go to contrib, tilt, there is a my poor attempt to implement this using tilt, which is uh, one of the ways to run uh, Docker in Docker. But what I was looking for is, where is my... So that's a kind, set up the kind. Here we go. So if you look for the tilt file, you will find these things like generate a PKI for everything. Generate certificates for alpha shard, generate certificates for beta shard, generate certs for proxy, cache, and go start deploy these things one by one. And there is a certificate thinking done by I think one of the controllers doing thinking basically is one of those uh, open source projects. Here we go, Reflector. This is kind of one of the ways how you can work around this uh, certificate syncing problem if you're not writing your custom code. So what I'm saying with this, if you ever need to look how to deploy this, this is kind of a good pointer to see because it has a Helm charts, example, charts values, has these things you need to set to make it running in the environment. Cool. And I think with this, I will stop sharing because I've been talking for way too long now. <laughs> Any questions? Do you found anything of my babbling for the last hour useful? <laughs> cool. If you have any questions, basically Slack is where you can ask them. Like some of the code I showed is not yet fully open source, but I'm working slowly bashing those out. They're in the public forks. I can always point you to those things. If you ask, it just, uh, my way of developing, I basically spin it in a shard somewhere, make it until running, and after that, cherry pick it back to the upstream. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, MJ. We are exactly at the top of the hour. So as MJ said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on the Slack channel. We're happy to help out. Um, you'll also find us here in two weeks again, same time, same meeting. Um, and, with and, that, yeah. and in two weeks, I think me and Stefan will be hanging out at KubeCon. So if you dare catch us at the project pavilion or somewhere around, if you want to talk face to face. Good point. So you, I guess you will find me here in two weeks, same, same place. <laughs> and you'll find MJ and Stefan at KubeCon, which is probably the cooler place to hang out. Cool. Okay. Thanks for listening and uh, maybe feedback in a Slack. Cool. That's